Thanks, uh, Srini and PK, for the invitation to speak today. And um, in the last 20 minutes, I still don't have any good news to say after Dr. Pinelli's great talk. So um, I'm going to just, uh, these are my disclosures, uh, review the uh, evidence for DES and DCB for BTK disease, uh, consider limitations and potential opportunities in future directions. Uh, I think it's clear after seeing the cases we've seen this morning and the uh, lectures on the um, use of uh, drug eluding technology below the knee that this is a very complicated issue and most CLTI patients have um, below the knee disease although many have multi-level disease and um, often associated with small infragenicular distal targets. It's a nice uh, pretext to this discussion about um, DES and DCB below the knees. This was uh, from Dr. Mustafa and Saab just uh, showing the uh, diffuse um, uh, nature of lesion location as well as uh, the lesion characteristics on the right. Um, most of these lesions we treat in studies are, are heavily calcified. So it's kind of a, a, a really nice summary of about uh, over 9,000 lesions in, in multiple studies. Um, the x-ray on the right really characterize a lot of the challenges we face, including heavy uh, medial calcification, non-compressibility of these vessels, um, which uh, represents a huge unmet need. Um, certainly, drug technology for below the knee disease um, started off um, fairly encouraging with some of the uh, drug eluting stent trials that were released. Now we're looking more at the Limus therapies, which I think um, initially have not been pursued due to the difficulty of delivering drug to the, um, uh, the vessel wall without a scaffold. Um, and paclitaxel being more lipophilic and rapidly transfers to the uh, vessel wall provides uh, better tissue retention, although we're seeing that um, that may not hold up so well for um, below the knee patients. Uh, the DES experience has um, highlighted the importance of controlled drug release in the first 30 to 60 days, and I, I think that's something we uh, really embrace uh, in um, our experience with drug eluting coronary stents. So this slide you've already seen, uh, I think Dr. Lukstein presented this slide, but it's essentially a summary of all the uh, DES for BTK, showing fairly encouraging uh, signals for um, target lesion revascularization, restenosis, and amputation. But I will just caution um, that most of these studies were lesion lengths somewhere in the 30 millimeter range, which of course is not typically the, the lesion lengths we treat. Uh, so drug-coded technology, um, and particularly specifically drug-eluting balloons, has been uh, um, an opportunity that provides some hope, uh, given the small disease that we treat, long lesions. Some of these patients have high bleeding risk, and so DAPT be can, can become an issue. Bifurcation disease, uh, drug balloons uh, perhaps lends some more flexibility in treating these things, um, as well as obviously the benefits of uh, drug-coated balloons um, for instant restenosis and other applications. So we kind of start our journey with uh, debate BTK, uh, which was 132 diabetic patients with CLTI, randomized one-to-one -to, -one to the Amphurium drug-coated balloon with a primary efficacy endpoint at 12 months, 12 months of binary restenosis, showing significant uh, benefit and uh, reduced rates of clinically driven target lesion revascularization. The safety of this device also seemed to be encouraging, and that really led us into the impact deep randomized controlled study, which was larger, 358 patients, random, randomized now in a two-to-one fashion to the impact balloon. The co-primary efficacy endpoint of clinically driven TLR uh, was not met, uh, but was numerically improved. The uh, late lumen loss endpoint was also not met. Uh, safety um, seemed to be a, a little concerning, and uh, there was actually um, higher rates of amputation at 12 months in the um, drug-coated balloon, and this really kind of put the brakes on um, the, the technology for the moment. Um, so what, what has also been um, interesting is the five-year follow-up data, which has subsequently been uh, presented by Thomas Seller, um, showing that there's a lot of attrition of this population, starting out with 358 randomized patients and about 150 left at about five years. So just showing um, the loss to follow-up, including uh, the high rates of mortality among this population, does really make this a challenging population to study. So the safety outcomes at five years, um, some of that uh, sig the safety signals were um, no longer retained, although again, there's a significant attrition of the follow-up um, of uh, the population studied. But um, numerically, I guess, in major amputation rates still remained higher in the impact ECB arm. 
So um, the safety endpoints, again, are represented here by a kaplan meyer curve showing freedom from amputation where angioplasty, um, at least uh, numerically, was a little better. There's no difference in freedom from all-cause death, however, which was encouraging. So what went wrong? We've kind of had this slide up, I think, on a couple other presentations this morning. Obviously, a very challenging population to study. There's a high rates of death and attrition, making these trials difficult to perform. There's substantial variability in lesion morphology, and, um, you know, we're... Uh, actively talking this morning about uh, the role for atherectomy and is it, you know, is it something we need to do all the time and, uh, you know, what's the, what's the protocol, which device, there's just tremendous variability in this population. Um, of course, it could be the wrong technology. Maybe this device wasn't the one. Um, maybe it's ineffective below the knee. Maybe the application and technique, we've all learned um, in the femoral popliteal segment how important um, uh, long and slow inflations are for these uh, patients. The drug dose was different from uh, some other devices. I've listed a table of some of the other devices on the market at the time Impact Deep came out, um, just showing that there's uh, different variations in formulations of excipient and drug. Um, and maybe it was the wrong antiproliferative drug. Limus and mTOR inhibitors seem to um, have a lot of advantages in the coronary circulation over microtubule inhibitors uh, like paclitaxel. So maybe that's it. And just a tremendous very, uh, number of variables to control for when doing these studies. The other interesting thing is uh, some investigators have really looked at you know, what, it, what does it mean for these drugs when we're dealing with uh, conditions of hypoxia. So this group of investigators did an animal model showing um, essentially serolimus versus paclitaxel um, cell activity and under normal oxygen conditions, there's really no difference. But when um, you have conditions of hypoxia, there seems to be some advantage in cell viability, um, both smooth muscle and endothelial cells um, with uh, serolimus. Um, of course, um, there's also this uh, concern about using drug coated balloons in distal segments versus proximal segments. Um, we seem to have more efficacy when we use drug eluting stents in the proximal seg segments, so that may, may be an issue. Uh, we've also encountered, I think, a lot of us who use drug-coated balloons, the issue of distal embolization of excipient and drug, um, and perhaps that leads to distal embolization, slow flow and arterial thrombosis in this high-risk CLI population. Um, Dr. Lee spoke to us this morning about sad and bad disease and, and how complicated that makes things. There's also distal tibial compliance, and more challenging to address in small vessels. Uh, proximal um, drug-coated balloons may have advantage here. Um, and then, of course, Dr. Finelli's work showing that the um, calcification of these vessels really uh, does make a difference in drug uptake and such an important factor for CLTI patients. So I think, uh, you know, PrEP and atherectomy then becomes a consideration. We have a definitive AR with no difference in CDTLR uh, rates. Um, looking at directional atherectomy, we really haven't studied it using other um, forms of atherectomy for this population in a rigorous way. Intravascular lithotripsy uh, and the serrator balloon may um, be particularly important adjuncts to vessel prep for DCB. And I think we need to focus on patients not suitable for DCB as folks who may be better off, better off to just undergo, uh, for example, a um, transcatheter arterialization of the deep veins. So I just wanted to spend in the last couple minutes uh, um, what evidence we do have. And um, I'm going to kind of turn towards um, Asia. So this is the ACOR1 uh, BTK trial. I think there was um, some patients enrolled in uh, Europe as well. But 105 patients with CLTI randomized one-to-one -to, -one to the Lidos um, drug-coated balloon using um, uh, three milligrams per millimeter squared of paclitaxel and a magnesium stearate excipient. This is Rutherford four to six patients with uh, tibial stenosis. Um, and the absence of pedal arch was importantly an exclusion for this study. Um, I just want to point out also that the lesion lengths are significantly longer, 168, 187 millimeters versus the 30 millimeters we have seen in um, some of the uh, drug eluding stent studies. So this um, uh, st study did meet its primary endpoint of late lumen loss, which was less than the DCB arm. There were secondary outcomes of restenosis, occlusion, death at 12 months. Essentially, um, everything was looking um, fairly positive. I show on the um, uh, came curve on the right, the freedom from clinically driven uh, TLR. And just to speak to the ongoing um, uh, uh, effect of our angioplasty and failure rates with the PTA, um, pretty significant failure rates in, in red of plain old balloon angioplasty at about six months. So they um, now have done the follow-up study to this uh, with 120 patients randomized to same balloon. Again, very long lesion lengths. 
Um, and again, showing um, improvements in primary patency, late lumen loss, uh, freedom from CDTLR, and uh, mortality being no different. So just, again, summarizing those two studies, you can see the differences in, um, in, in long lesions specifically. So uh, with that, I will um, just wrap it up. And essentially, I think we've got a lot of work left to do. There are some um, encouraging signals for drug eluding technology, but perhaps not in the same formulations we're currently delivering them and not without additional <laughs> adjunctive uh, therapies to deliver these products. So thank you.